Good morning, Park City's family. Vision Sunday is coming on September 9th. Pastor Jeff Warren will be sharing the message, Happy Church, along with his vision and prayer for this year at PCBC, followed by our outdoor baptism celebration on the front lawn. It will be an incredible day of worship and anticipation for the days ahead. Does a love of science diminish a life of faith or does it enhance it? On Saturday, September 15th at 6.30 p.m., Park Cities will host Crosstalk with Oxford professor, Dr. Alistair McGrath, world-renowned expert in biology, anthropology, theology, and a former atheist, as he discusses what religion and faith bring alongside science to help answer questions surrounding our existence, identity, and purpose. If science fills in one part and faith fills in another part, how do they interact? Religion is not about contradicting scientific explanation, it's saying there is more that needs to be said. Plus, a special kids program featuring DFW's own Critter Man and the Blackland Prairie Raptor Center. You will not want to miss this opportunity to bring a friend to hear Alistair McGrath on September 15th. Um, let's do this. Let's pray, and we're going to uh, dive into the Word of God. Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes with me? Lord, we thank you that we get to sing in the victory of the cross today, that we're reminded again. It's why we're here. We remember what you've done for us. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, speak through your Word even more powerfully, your Word today, that it would change our hearts. Teach us, God, to, to be uh, peacemakers. Help us learn how to, uh, to enter into conflict and relationships that we find ourselves in and to do as you've called us to do. And thank you for the peace that you have brought to us uh, because of the cross. And I ask that you would speak now, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew 5 if you have your Bible. I hope you do. Hey, it was September the 30th, 1938. Neville Chamberlain was the uh, prime minister of Great Britain. He went to meet with a famous meeting that he had in Munich with uh, then-Chancellor, the Fuhrer, uh, Adolf Hitler. He came back from this meeting seeking to appease Hitler. There was kind of the Czechoslovakian conflict that was going on, if you know any World War II history. And, uh, and, and there was real tension uh, in, in Eastern Europe at the time. And so he comes back and he offers this infamous now speech. And in it, he says this. My good friends, for the second time in our history, a British prime minister has returned from Germany bringing peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. That's the, that's the famous phrase, peace for our time. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Now go home and everyone have a nice quiet night of sleep. Well, within about a year, Germany was advancing into Poland, and by that point, Great Britain, France had declared war on Germany, and within just a couple of years, uh, Germany unleashed a merciless bombing raid on London, the home of the Prime Minister, and uh, all of Great Britain's major cities. Seeking to avoid conflict, Chamberlain thought it'd be easier to somehow make peace without challenging Hitler on what they knew was happening. And what they thought, you know, because what happened over time then, Hitler was able to build his army bigger and bigger. And most people look back and say, man, if they had challenged him then, the, the war would not have started. Think of the hundreds of thousands of people impacted through World War II. And then you know what happened? Germany ultimately loses the war after all the allies joined together, but not without great cost and great uh, loss of life. You know, all the peace that you and I have in our lives has actually come about because of someone else. The peace that we have in our country, we talked about, you know, nations that are experiencing uh, dis, uh, you know, all kinds of unrest and war and many of the immigrants and refugees who have to flee those places because there's unresolved conflict and it could cost them their lives. The peace that we have in our nation has come about because other people have gone before us, right? And so today, what I want to talk about, I want to ask you the question, have you ever thought it better to, 
to kind of avoid conflict in order to keep peace. You ever been there? I think we all have. And what I want you to think about, we're going to get this right down to a very personal level, very practical message today. I want you to think about some of the challenging relationships you might be in now. I want you to think about places where, you know, there's some conflict in your life. And we're going to talk about how you can resolve conflict because Jesus says this. Here it is. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, I've got to say this. Whenever you see sons of God, we see this in the epistles. Paul talks about we've become, you know, we're adopted sons. Uh, and, and, and I know that like the women, right? All the women, like, son, what about daughters? I mean, come on, you know, right? But here's the thing. In, 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 in biblical times and understanding, you know, sons were the ones who inherited all things. And, and so when it references sons, it means all of us. We all know this. But what's happening here is saying, no, no, no. In, in very patriarchal society even, Okay, it's women who are also joined into the family of God and receive the inheritance of all that comes from the Father. Amen. So this is great news. Jesus lifted up, raised up women more than any person who's ever lived. So don't be thrown by that. But notice that Jesus says, be a peacekeeper, not a peace. Not I mean, be a peace. Yeah, peacemaker. Okay, not a peacekeeper. He doesn't just say be peaceable. All right. So there's an active role. In, in, uh, involved in peacekeeping. So what I want us to do, again, is understand that any peace that we've experienced, you know, think about the hammering out of laws and, and someone resolves some conflict so that we could have the laws that we live by that bring about peace. And it's true in your life. It's true in my life that ultimately all peace, this is where this goes, from the start to the finish, all the peace that we're going to experience in our lives first comes because of the peace that we have with God because of Jesus Christ. Christ has come. He resolved the conflict between us and, and the Father, us and himself, us and God. And now he has come to make a way. Jesus embodies every one of these beatitudes. And he's the one who became the ultimate peacemaker for us. We're going to talk further about that. But look at Colossians 1, 19. You can see it on the screen. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Everybody say all things. All things. Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's how it's happened. Through his sacrifice upon the cross for us, right? True peace finds its origin in God. So I see Lewis. He said that there is no peace. God cannot give us peace apart from himself because, listen, apart from himself, it does not exist. There's peace out. I mean, there's a conflict outside of you because there's conflict in you. The conflict that we experience in our lives is because of the conflict that's in our hearts. But watch this. Peacemaking is not avoiding uh, it's not appeasing. It's not running from the problem. And man, do we need peacemakers in our world today. Anybody? Do we need peacemakers in our nation today? We need peacemakers in Washington. We need peacemakers in our government. We need peacemakers in our schools, in our families. We need peacemakers in our friendships. We need peace with our roommates you need peace with your boyfriend or girlfriend. And we all who are married need peace in our hearts so that we can get along, right? In the, the famous words of Rodney King, why can't we all just get along? Because of sin in every one of us. Now, those of us who have received Christ, we're forgiven, we've been redeemed, but we still wrestle with this. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to as a pastor through the years who've said, Jeff, I haven't talked to my dad in years. I haven't talked to my mom in years. I haven't talked to my brother in decades. I mean, we used to be close, but we, I mean, it's, I don't even talk to them anymore. I can't be in the same room with my mom. I can't be in the same room with that person in my family. Do you know that your conflict in relationship with your life impacts your relationship with God? The Bible teaches us that the horizontal relationships of our lives directly, inextricably linked to the vertical. In fact, the Bible says that your prayers are impacted by conf unresolved conflict with other people. In 1 Peter, it says to husbands, in essence, if you don't resolve conflict with your wife, your prayers will be hindered. 
I don't know if you've ever made that connection. In fact, the Bible teaches us that, that, that the other side of that is this. James 3.18 says, A harvest of righteousness, I love this, is sown in peace by those who make peace. So here's the point today. If you're going to have a healthy family, if you're going to have a healthy uh, work team, you know, at work, in the workplace, if you're going to have a healthy marriage, if you're going to have healthy friendships, if you're going to have a healthy connect group, healthy church, you've got to learn how to resolve conflict. And Jesus says, peacemakers are those who are happy. This is one of the most important skills you can learn in all of life. Because we got, and we got to teach our kids. We've got to model the role for our children because they're going to face conflict throughout their lives. And many of us, you need to take notes on this sermon. I've got lots of points today, lots of references to Scripture. You know, we're gonna, we've got the one line from Jesus, and we're going we're gonna to look at what it is, some steps in, in resolving conflict. So I want you to take notes, because if you're not in conflict now, promise you, you will be. You're going to need this. I'm going to save you thousands of dollars of counseling today, all right? So um, just make your check out to Park City's Baptist Church, <laughs> and uh, we'll take another offering after we're done, all right? Um, but hey, uh, here's the thing. I want to talk about how to, how, to, uh, how to be a peacemaker. So I've got my own B attitudes, all right? A little tongue in cheek, but B, first one, look at this. Be the first to move, all right? Be the first to move. You take the first move. This is the hardest part. This is why I've got it first. This is the most difficult part. You know, anything's easier than diving into conflict. And you can imagine, you know, as your pastor, you probably don't want, you know, if you know somebody who loves conflict, probably don't have any friends, right? I mean, you don't want to be around that person. Uh, but there's a way to learn and to grow. This is something I've had to learn and to grow. You probably don't want your pastor to just be, yeah, we need more conflict is what we need in our lives and in our church. And so this is something that I continue to grow in and have learned so much. And I'm going to offer much of what I've learned here today. But do you realize that um, if we don't make the first move, in fact, Jesus teaches us to do so. But if you don't, it impacts, in fact, your worship. Your corporate worship with the body is impacted by unresolved conflict in your life. Some of you had conflict on the way to church today, and it's impacting your worship. I mean, you're still kind of stirring, kind of angry, right? And, in, and so Matthew 5, listen to this, and not too many verses away from the Beatitudes here, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Check that out. Not you against your brother, but you got conflict because of him. I mean, he, he's, got, he's got something against you because you've done something, evidently, right? So there's conflict. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now notice that. It says, like, now. Now, if I see anybody, we won't, it, it'd be a little awkward, but if somebody else start leaving, uh, we'll know you're going to deal with something. Because, you, you know, it's like, now, i got to deal with this right now. Now, it does say first leave your, it says leave your offering. Yeah, so you can leave your offering, and then you do that, and then go. So we took the offering, now you can leave, okay? Um, so it says first be reconciled, do it at once. Don't let it continue. In the words of the great Barney Fife, anybody? Okay, most underrated television show of all time. Am I right? Okay, thank you. Nip it in the bud, is what he would say. Some of you young people are like, Bar what? Who's Bar I know Barney, like the dinosaur. I don't know what he's talking about. Okay, so nip it in the bud. This is another way of saying, listen, when, when you, if you have a little sapling, little teeny roots going in the ground, you can pull that up in, without any problem at all. Not a lot of damage to the soil. I mean, bam, pull that out like a weed. If you let it grow. You let it grow over time, and those roots start to run. You try to pull out a big oak tree in your yard. You've got trouble. I mean, that is work. It is hard. It is violent. You've got something. So you, you've got to go after it early on. I'm going to tell you, um, this week, uh, I, I started to see, uh, and, you know, you can imagine. It's like heaven working here on our staff. You just know that. But... Every now and then, so I, I'm always watching. A big part of my role as a pastor shepherd is to, is to challenge us, always protecting the unity of the body. And it's your, it's your challenge. It's all of us together, right? So I started to, to sense maybe there's a little tension, something. We, we, it wasn't a big deal, but I, after a meeting, I said, okay, I want everybody involved in this 
to stay, we're going to talk about this face to face. I mean, we've been talking about it, email and whatnot. There's a meeting there. Y'all had a meeting. You, you see this in your workplace, right? And so I said, we're going to get around the table. And I do this often. I want everybody in the room. We're going to talk. Okay? So we got together. We talked. And you know what happened? Greater empathy and understanding, motivation behind what we're talking about here. This is how, because it took collaboration on the part of several of us here as leaders and pastors. And we left just a half an hour meeting. I say that went more than that. Um, we left a meeting saying, you know what? I get it. I understand this. We're good. You know, there may not have been 100% across the board, but everybody in the room said, I understand. And man, we love each other. And we're in this together. And it was, a, it was a great meeting because everyone left with empathy and understanding. But the hardest thing to do is to step in it first. And Jesus says, be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper. And it takes an active role for all of us. So secondly, look at this. Be humble and prayerful. Ask God for help. Come before Him. This is the first step. A lot of us go, yeah, oh yeah, right, pray. Listen, this is the one step we miss in so many aspects of our lives. In fact, in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him come to God, and he gives it freely. What a gift this is. That the Lord would say, you just come to me, and I'll give you the wisdom you need. You're going to say, man, I don't want to enter into that conflict. I don't know what to say. I don't know where this is going to go. So you know what you do. In your mind, you're well, I'm going to tell him this. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell him that. And he says, I'm going to tell him that. You have this conversation in your brain and then all of a sudden weeks go by. You don't even you don't have a conversation. And you're instead of having a conversation with God, you're having a conversation in your own head. You need to speak truth into your life. Let God's spirit work in your heart instead of thinking, I got to think through this. I'm going to say and some of you uh, are, are involved in, in very difficult challenges right now. And you're anxious. Maybe you're unable to sleep at night. Are you praying? Are you coming before him? Because you know this, conflict doesn't resolve itself. People say, um, you know, time heals. Time doesn't heal anything. The Spirit of God heals. God heals. And so we turn to him, and he's the one who can then heal our hearts and give us wisdom. Uh, the Holy Spirit heals. Come to him in prayer. That's a key piece I've thought about putting it first, but I think you've got to make the first move, but you've got to pray and say, Lord, help me know what to say. Number three, by, uh, be courageously loving. That's my next B attitude. Be courageously loving. Here's what I mean. It takes courage to step into it. And one of the first things you need to do is perhaps, again, very practical for some of us, you've got to set up a meeting. I mean, you've got to do what I did. I'm going to say, okay, gang, listen, here's what's going to happen on Tuesday. We're going to come together. We're going to talk about this. And you need to do the same. There needs to be a safe place where you can sit down. If you need somebody else with you there, you can do that. But if it's just between two of you, some of you are going to be led today to actually reach out to someone that you're in conflict, in conflict with. You're going to be a peacemaker. And part of that is, is stepping into that. Now, nobody who's rational likes conflict. But we all need to step in. Why do we postpone? Why do we delay? Why do we not move into that? You know what it is? It's fear. That's what it is. Name it. It's fear. It's fear that will be rejected, though they're not going to understand me. It's fear that, uh, that gosh, I'm going to be, you know, somehow put down. I'm gonna, I, 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 it's fear that, that you know, I, so we just, I'm, I'm just not going to go there. And instead, here's, here's the deal. How do you find courage to enter into conflict? You know what it is? It's love. The great motivator is love. The reason we don't enter into, into conflict resolution with our mom, our dad, our siblings, or a spouse when we have trouble with friends or a roommate, or so, it's because we don't love them enough. You might be saying, no, Jeff, you don't know. No, you wouldn't love them either. I mean, I'm just telling you, we got problems. No, no, no. Be a peacemaker. We're to be a peacemaker. We're to do all that we can on our part to express love. We don't, we don't go after them because we don't love them. You, you tell me this. What would cause you to run into, you know, dive into the water when you see a child drowning? What would cause you to run into a burning building to save a child? You know what it is? Your love for the child overcomes your fear, right? Our love for others overcomes our fear. 
Because the Bible tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. Look at 1 John 4, 18. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. It's our love for others that overcomes our fear. It's our love for others that causes us to enter into ministries like For the Nations and Opportunity. Many of you are going, that's cool, that's awesome, I love what they're doing. I'm glad there are people out there doing that stuff. Somebody's got to do that. Instead of saying, well, why wouldn't, maybe the Lord's calling me to. No, nah, you know, might get, I mean, I'm a little fearful, it might take too much time, might get messy. Of course it's going to get messy. Life is messy, ministry is messy, but a lot of us don't have a relationship problem with others. We have a love problem. That's our problem. We don't love others enough. You know, this week, you saw it, um, we lost a, an American hero in John McCain, right? And uh, he was, I mean, throughout his career, he was known throughout his life for stepping into conflict. All the way from the Vietnam War, right? Where he's a POW. He ends up entering into politics and, and, and he, he was known as a man who spoke truth, but he also honored with dignity everybody on each side. So the Republicans didn't agree with him. Democrats didn't agree with him. Then Democrats, they agreed with him. Republicans agreed with him. But everybody agreed that he was a man of integrity and he was fearless in the face of conflict. It's why he had President Obama and President Bush speak at his memorial by his request. Because everybody knew this man knows what's happening. And it was his love. He was, he was a believer um, and a member at North Phoenix Baptist Church. But he, he was, uh, he was a, a man who loved country, right? He was a bridge builder, not a wall builder. And God has called us as peacemakers to be bridge builders, not wall builders, right? And some of us are building walls because we think it's everybody else's fault, Here's the, here's the fourth thing. And by the way, if you're running out of paper there, we're going to about, we got eight of them. Four, watch this. Be aware of your own faults, all right? Acknowledge your part. Man, I've learned this. You got to be humble to say, man, show me my blind spots. You got to have people who speak into your life. Do you have people who are pointing out your blind spots in your life? It's so critical. Uh, you don't know what they are. That's why they're called blind spots, right? You need people to show you what they are. Jesus references this again in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. You can see it on the screen. Why do you see, you've seen this before, see the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Almost humorous. I mean, he is being humorous, but how or how can you say to your brother, hey, let me take the speck out of you. We enter into conflict. Let me tell you what's wrong with you so we can resolve this thing. Right? And if you have conflict between another person, 50-50 just might be your fault, not their fault. Right? And so he says, let me take this, this out of your... When there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite, two-faced, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will be able to see. How about that? You, you, you work on yourself first, then you're able to see with the eyes of God. You can take the speck out of your brother's eye with grace. First take the log out of your eye. You, if, you, if you're at peace with God and you, you have confessed your own sin before Him, here's the deal. Peace in my heart means that, that, that other things around me aren't going to bother me. If I don't have peace in my heart, man, anything will take me off. If I have peace, nothing will take me off. You ever know anybody who just has this calm, anxious, I mean non-anxious presence? Peace of God. Would people describe you that way? If not, you might be the problem, right? You might be the one creating conflict. You ever know anyone who, who uh, just kind of has conflict around them all the time? There's conflict within the heart. They're hurting. You've got to look at yourself first. Look, at, in fact, in James 4, 1, it says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You see what he's saying? Conflict outside of you is conflict within you. That's what it is. It's pride. It's sin. Somebody said that sin and pride both have the same middle letter, I. It's all about me. It's all about me. And some of you say, like in your marriage, maybe, or in a dating relationship, well, we, we struggle because we're just not real compatible in this area. No, you're not compatible at all. Nobody is. 
You can't go there. I mean, sinners have a hard time working with each other, right? And many of you who are married like me, you know, Stacy and I, we're like opposites. It's true, opposites attract, right? And you, we, you could argue we're not compatible at all. But through the years, you know what happens? Because she's not like me, she's like a mirror, right? She's, I mean, I have grown more in my relationship with God because of my relationship with her. And I can tell you, after 34 years of marriage, I can tell you that resolving conflict and the rewards that come take you to deeper and deeper love for each other. And, and, it's, and it's worth every bit of it because you come to love one another through those difficult times. But look at what it says here. It's, it's our sin. It's pride. I love Proverbs 13, 10. It says, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Simply put, pride just leads to arguments. It's all it does. I mean, I mean you know, you want to you come clean in an argument? Just say, you know what? I'm so whipping prideful. That's our problem. I mean, have you ever done that before? Uh, man, I was just thinking about me the whole time is what I was doing. Sorry. Now let's go from here. Have you ever? Yeah, the ladies are just laughing over here <laughs> as if that would happen, right? So she falls out on the floor. She goes, what did you just say? Yeah, I was just thinking about me. That's all I was doing. And yet we all do that. Can you be honest, courageous, bold enough in your relationships to, to at least, because some of you are thinking, I hope you are, think about how you're going to apply this message. And you're thinking, Jeff, you don't know. I mean, like, it's all their problem. It is 99% <laughs> their problem. Well, then you need to come with your 1% and say, look, here's my 1%. No, you don't say that. But you come in and you say, hey, hey, listen, I, here's my problem. Confess your sin. Because the truth is, it's more than 1% on you. And, and the Bible tells us, listen, pride is the problem. Look at number five. Be quick to listen. All right? This is James 1.19, where it says, quick to, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You listen to understand, get the facts straight. It's so important. But you also listen to hear about the pain behind it. I know for, gosh, for women, this is true for men as well, but I know for women who don't feel, when my wife doesn't feel that I've listened to her, right? The, the act of listening is grace. You say, I don't know how to enter into conflict. I don't know what to say. Listen. Get with the person face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Listen. Just be a good listener. Because in listening, you're extending grace. You're coming to understand not just the facts, but what's going on behind that, right? Because women... Uh, in particular, if you guys, if you just kind of, you know, she's telling you, pouring her heart out to you and you say, OK, well, now, here, and I used to do this in our marriage, probably still do periodically. But I used to do it a lot. She shared, OK, you're telling me all this. You're sharing, pouring your heart out to me because you want me. I can I can help fix you. That, I, mean, I can help fix this. Right. We do this, man, don't we? So she's pouring her heart out. Honey, here's what you need to do. OK, number one, point number one. OK, you need to do this. And then number two and then three. Uh, there you go. Huh? Am I right? Am I amazing? And she feels completely invalidated. And so she, over time, you know, I didn't share all this with you so you could fix me. I want you to understand. I just want you to listen. Guys, listen. When your wife is talking and you're going, get to the point, get to the point, ball game's on, get to the point. Is she talking? That is the point. That's the point. The point is to listen, to validate her, bless her, and love her. Be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. I love Philippians 2, 4, and 5. Let each of you not only look at your own interest, okay, look not only at your own interest, but also the interest of others. And if you do so, look, you have the mind of Christ. You're going to be like Him. You're going to look. You're going to focus. The word is scopus, like we get microscope, telescope, Focus in on what they're telling you. Focus in on the needs that they have. And you're going you're gonna to see the pain behind what's going on in their hearts. Because conflict is within. Number six, be truthful and kind. All right? Be truthful and kind. Ephesians 4.15, rather speak in truth and love. You're gonna, we, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. The truth is not enough. It's how you speak the truth. That matters. Last week, no, two weeks ago, we talked about this. Be gentle. Gentle people are happy people. 
And so it's not enough to say, I'm going to outwin, I'm going to win this argument here. I'm going to out-argue you. We've said, too, that it matters. Never yell at your kids. Raising your voice in an argument or conflict resolution doesn't work. Part of being truthful is, is, is about being clear, being explicit. So here's another one. Number seven, be clear about rules of engagement. Um, you know, there are no harmful words. Some words are off limits is what we mean here. And this is so important in relationships. Like, hey, let's be clear. Because here's what we do. Some words are off limits. We do this, don't we? Uh, we exaggerate. You always, right? No, no, no. It's off limits. You never, no. Unless, it's, unless, unless your husband never takes the trash out, right? No, you never take the trash out. You're right. Never do. I never do. Okay. But it's not, it's not that, right? We, we use this exaggerated language. You know, back in, uh, even prior to World War II, they had what they called uh, WMDs. Anybody? Weapons of mass destruction. It's like, okay, these are off limits, you know, biological, nuclear uh, bombs or whatever else. And, and so you, you, some things are off limits. Stacy and I, we, we did this early on in our marriage. This may sound weird, but we had certain rules. Uh, and, and one of the words that we said we're not going to use uh, we're not going to say divorce. We're not going to use that word in our house. Our kids are never going to hear us say that. Our kids are going to know that mom and dad are in this for life. And, th- and that might sound kind of kind of weird, but we, we just, you know, we just decided that's not going to happen. Decide what the rules are and talk about those. And if you want to know a list, look at Colossians 3 verse 8. But But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. If we had time, we could go through each of these and say, here's a list. Because it's things like, don't speak in anger. Don't raise your voice. Stay calm. Okay, don't use words that you know are going to intentionally hurt that person. You bring up something like, you know, here's, and you know, man, that's like a dagger. That's a, that's a weapon of mass destruction. Slander, that's accusatory language. Or using exaggerated speech, belittling someone, casting blame, or, or filthy language, it says. Don't, don't curse. Don't ever curse when you're trying to resolve conflict. Attack the problem, not the person. Uh, I heard Rick Warren say, fix the problem, don't fix the blame on someone. The blame wastes your time. Number eight, be committed to reconcile the relationship. That's your whole point. The goal is reconciliation and not necessarily resolution. Resolute, resolute means determined, like as if to say we agree on everything now. No, agree that the relationship matters even more than, than what you might disagree on. Establish, reestablish the relationship. This is what God's called us to in our relationships. He's called to us to it in the world, reconciling people. You know of my passion for racial reconciliation in our city, for us to be a lead church and a people who are making this happen because God has told us, Romans 12, 8, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And then finally, be at peace with the ultimate peacemaker. You'll never have peace in your heart or in your relationship if you're not walking intimately with Christ and you're not constantly confessing your sin and just seeking to be like Him. And listen, friends, if you're here and you've never received Christ, no wonder you have such conflict in your heart. It's constant. And the conflict in your heart, this sense of not being forgiven, this shame and blame that you have in your heart, and this unrest that's always there, seeking to define yourself through your performance or the approval of others, you're just on this treadmill, and it is creating all kinds of tension with people all around you. And it's because you have not settled peace with God. He's done all that is necessary for you to have peace with Him. And if you've never received Christ, I want you to hear this. Colossians 1 Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, here it is, to reconcile to him all, himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In Ephesians 14, it says Christ is our peace, and he has broken down the wall of division, and he's reconciled us. The wall of hostility, he's reconciled us to God. So I plead with you. Here it is. Be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Be a bridge builder, not a wall builder. 
So here's how this goes. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 20. You see how central this is? Watch this. We'll close with this. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given that to us. It's at the heart of what it means to be a Christ follower. That is, in Christ, here's the first thing, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, for Christ, God making his appeal through us in the way that we resolve conflict and love others with, in, with integrity and dignity and honor. We implore you, we beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see how central this peacemaking is to being a follower of Jesus? Well, so the story goes, Neville Chamberlain decided that it was better to simply appease and not face conflict in hopes that peace would come. And as a result, thousands of lives were lost. Germany ultimately lost the war. Their country was split up ultimately divided by the middle, in the middle, between East and West Berlin, 1961. It wasn't until 1989. You might remember, Reagan went there, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, in his famous speech, tear down this wall. And the wall was torn down. A friend of mine was over there, taking a, an axe, a pickaxe, to the wall, along with everybody else celebrating. And he gave me this little piece of the Berlin Wall. I have it sitting on my shelf in my office. It's a little concrete with some little rocks in it. And uh, some spray paint on it. And I have this in my office sitting on the shelf where I can see it. And every time I see it, I'm reminded that God's called me to be a bridge builder. Not a wall builder. And he's called you to do the same. Tear down the walls in your life. Do what he's called us to do. And you will be among those whom Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Let's pray together. Lord, you've called us to be peacemakers, and we thank you that you have made a way for us. You're so good to us, and we praise you. And I thank you, God, that we can rejoice in who we are. It all starts with the fact that we are anointed, we're gifted. We become sons and daughters of the Most High King. And Lord, I pray that you would just cause us to leave this place and to go into every relationship in the workplace where, where you've prompted us by your Spirit in our homes, in our marriage. Some of us need to come clean today. And we need to do it quick. We need to confess our sin. We need to own our part. And Lord, help us to be reminded how good you've been to us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus. And we give our hearts to you now as we commit ourselves to you.